flaws in electoral procedures threaten democracy. In the first part of this two-parter, we saw no electoral system is perfectly fair. But if obvious flaws in electoral procedures are not patched, they will be exploited at the expense of democracy. Coming up in this video, how the Democrats can win the 2020 presidential elections, the uneven Dutch Senate elections, gerrymandering in Flanders, no election on election day. Welcome back to the channel of the Political Academy. My name is Joost Smits. In the second part of a two-part video, I will show some examples of flaws in electoral procedures and how they can be taken advantage of at the expense of a democracy. The first video was about ways to count votes and decide upon a winner. Let's get started. This video would not be complete without a look at the US presidential elections. Of course, there are already many videos about this that look at it in more depth. Here I will use it as part of my narrative about exploitation of flaws in electoral procedures. Well known is that Presidents George W. Bush and Donald H. Trump were elected while their opponent won the popular vote. This is not necessarily unfair. It is understandable if a people decides that, for example, rural areas need to be protected from domination by the more densely populated cities. This means that some procedure needs to be devised that corrects the result of the popular vote. In the US, this was described as one of the topics in a series of articles and essays by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and John Jay under the pseudonym Publius. This collection was called The Federalist. What I find more problematic is the so-called pluralitarian nature. It is not required to have at least 50% of the popular vote. It suffices to have the most votes. Trump became president with 46% of the popular vote versus Mrs. Clinton with 48%. This contrasts with Mr. Cl Mr. Clinton winning the presidency in 1992 with just 43%, the lowest since Nixon in 1968 with that same percentage. Kennedy also became head of state with less than 50%, albeit 49.7. For the US presidential elections, votes are counted per state. The candidate with the most votes wins the entire state. Per state, a number of electors are sent to the electoral college to determine who will become president. States with larger populations, like California, have more electors than smaller states. In any case, all electors of a state will vote for the candidate who only needed most of the votes. This means that all other votes are discarded, wasted, trashed. They are not weighted, used to determine representation, nothing. In the previous video, we saw already how much ambig ambiguity exists in a system that only looks at the first preference of voters, let alone when only those first preferences of a group of voters is used to represent all preferences of all voters. This is one of the reasons that some think this system is not just unfair or undemocratic, but not a true election, at best a half election. This flaw in electoral law leads to distinction between voter groups for political campaigns. In any campaign, it is necessary to divide resources wisely over time to maximize the outcome. However, data for the bush carry campaign of 2004 clearly show the candidates concentrate on so-called swing states. Each waving hand in the left-hand graphic represents a visit from a candidate during the final five weeks of the election. The right-hand map shows how much money was spent on TV advertising. Each dollar sign represents one million dollars in the same last five weeks. You can imagine that these states had the ear of the candidate. Promises were made, etc. It also means that campaign plans focus less on good arguments, convincing voters, credible policy proposals, and more on just getting to plurality in as many states as possible. Those states with certain wins or certain losses would be discarded as in not getting much attention. In this picture, we see precinct data gathered by Ryan Roller aggregated to larger statistical areas by Ron Johnston in his 2019 publication. 
The Republican campaign could focus on those areas which were above 50% in the 1992 to 2012 period, over here, but not too certain, and were in the right states, and then they tried to push them higher on the y-axis as the result in 2016. This results in the dotted regression line actually being curved upwards. If you look at the graphic, the target was to minimize the beige dots, the beige areas, and maximize the purple and the green areas giving the aforementioned conditions. If we turn the graphic around, which is not quite accurate since we neglect third-party candidates in some of the elections, the Democrats could copy this strategy for, for the 2020 elections. Minimize the purple areas, maximize the beige areas and the orange areas, as long as they are in the right states. That all voters are important, but some are more important than others, does not only hold for the US presidential elections, but also for the Dutch Senate. The Dutch Senate is presumably less political than the Dutch Parliament. It is supposed to reflect on legislation that has passed Parliament before it becomes law. Therefore, the Senate is not voted for directly by the people, but by the members of, of the provincial assemblies. Unlike the US electors, who are not supposed to vote against the outcome of the state, Dutch provincial representatives usually vote very strategically to give the existing majority in parliament the most seats. This sometimes leads to surprises in how the Senate seats are divided, but that is not the issue I want to raise. There are three mechanisms going on that create flaws in the Senate election. Each of them do not seem to be unfair. So, what is going on? First, how many seats should a provincial assembly have? They should not be too large, since then there is not enough work for the elected representatives. They should not be too small, otherwise the representatives are swamped in work and cannot deliver the quality that is expected of them. So, Dutch law has a scale to determine the number of seats depending on the size of the population. Provinces with populations below 400,000 inhabitants get 39 seats, and provinces with more than 2 million inhabitants get 55 seats. That sounds reasonable. Next, when these representatives vote for the Senate, a correction must be made. Otherwise, a representative from a province of over 2 million inhabitants, representing at least 2 million divided by 55 equals 36,363 people, is outvoted by a representative from a small province representing at most 400,000 divided by 39 equals 10,256 people. Therefore, the number of inhabitants is divided by the number of seats, times 100, and then rounded to the nearest integer. That way, each provincial representative's vote has the same weight. Right? Wrong. First, the scale to determine the number of seats for the provincial assembly is too short. The orange line represents the current scale. The gray line represents the current situation of inhabitants versus seats. As you can see, in three provinces, it is relatively harder to get at least one seat, and the margin between seats is much larger. The green line is a possible extension of the scale to fix the situation, and the purple line shows how inhabitants numbers align. To keep costs low and assemblies smaller instead of a linear method, it can also be repaired with a curved scale. In any case, in the current situation, the three most populated provinces are hampered, and that situation will worsen as provinces outgrow the scale. Second, only those 18 years or older are invited to vote, not the entire population. Immigrants are not invited for provincial elections either. Therefore, there is also an advantage for parties to gain votes in provinces with lots of youth 
and immigrants. Here is a graphic representation of the proportion of the population per province that is invited to vote. Thirdly, voting is not obligatory, and in certain provinces, turnout is less than in other provinces. Since the value by which votes are weighted to vote for the Senate is based on the entire population, there's an advantage for parties in provinces with low turnout. If you consider not voting to be a choice, like voting for a party, it is not exactly, this is just a simplification, campaigns to get out the vote for a certain party have a higher yield in low turnout provinces. Also, it means that parties that are successful in those provinces will not be inclined to improve the general turnout. It does not help them, decreases their percentage share in the provincial assembly and decreases their influence on the vote for the Senate. If we combine the last two flaws, we can see a clear division between the top five provinces and the bottom seven. Three of those five do have the first problem of the short scale. The total effect is hard to calculate because of the strategic voting for the Senate. But I estimated for 2019 at least one party that did not get a seat in the Provincial Assembly of North Holland and one seat in the Senate that might have gone to the coalition if rules were not flawed. However, as can be seen, through strategic voting, the effect was almost nullified in 2019, but that does not need to be the case every year, especially if parties use these flaws more effortlessly. In the end, it means that political parties in the Netherlands have an incentive not to improve turnout and to distinguish between valuable and less valuable voters just on the basis of the province they live in. This could be repaired by not weighting the votes according to the number of inhabitants on 1st January of every election year, but by the number of valid votes. This also makes the procedure simpler, not requiring a headcount on the 1st of January of every election year. Gerrymandering has become the synonym of redrawing district lines to get a more favorable outcome. In 1810, Elbridge Gerry was elected governor of Massachusetts. In 1812, he signed the Massachusetts Senate districting bill. The effect was remarkable. Although his party lost the popular vote 50,164 to 50,766, in the Senate they won 29 to 11. It was clear that the redistricting had worked on the favor of Gerry's party. Already in March 1812, the artist Elkana Tisdale, often it is misattributed to Gilbert Stewart, noticed the strange new map of the Essex district. He added a head and wings and claws, and there, he said, that will do for a salamander. Better say a gerrymander, replied the editor, Benjamin Russell. In 1985, 173 years later, the Supreme Court declared gerrymandering unconstitutional. Nevertheless, the formation of districts is an issue, not just out of political reasons, also st statistical ones. This famous little book discusses all kinds of effects when large areas are split up into smaller areas and measurements are taken of what is going on inside the areas, or when areas are combined. It holds the quote, quite simply, the aerial units, zonal objects, used in many geographical studies are arbitrary, modifiable and subject to the whims and fancies of whoever is doing or did the aggregating. And counting the votes of an election is like a simple geographical statistical study. There is an example that correlation between the yield of wheat and potatoes varies with how areas are divided. To get an idea of the insidious influence of geography on voting results, let's revisit our little village again. There are 49 people in this village. They live in a grid pattern of horizontal streets and vertical lanes. They agree that every street has one representative in the town council. Hence, 
there are seven seats in this council. There are only two parties, green and purple. The party with most support in the street will have the seat, which is a plurality rule. As you can see, green has a slight disadvantage in the popular vote. 49% to 51% for purple. We can put the color of the representative next to each street. The town council has three seats for green versus four for purple. Green has 43% of the council seats. Even though there is a nice geometric pattern in the distribution of votes, you can see the problems are just around the corner of these cozy streets. For example, this guy here may not be happy with his choice and if he changes his mind, the popular support in the community is now for green. 51% to 49% for purple. But the council representation does not change. Now, let's move some years into the future. A number of inhabitants switch their vote, but most of them stuck with their earlier decision, as is normal in reality. As you can see, popular support is still 49% for green and 51% for purple. The council distribution would still be 3 seats for green and 4 for purple, but something has changed. In some previous period, green did have the majority and they changed the district lines. From now on, the council will not be formed on the basis of the horizontal streets, but by the vertical lanes. And now green, although it does not have the popular vote, will have a 71% predominance in the town council. Five seats to only two for purple. In 1812, redistricting took more effort to construct a district such that the right party would have the advantage. But the principle is the same. Changing the geographical zones can have all kinds of expected and unexpected influences on the outcome of elections. Therefore, if someone proposes to start using a district system or change district lines, investigate the consequences thoroughly. So, now we move to Belgium. In Belgium, they decided to have less districts in Flemish provinces after the elections of 2012. However, with an only slightly smaller number of seats for the province and a much smaller number of districts per province, the number of seats per district went up. And as a consequence of this Belgian form of gerrymandering, although with not with the same intentions, we may hope, the number of parties with seats in provinces in Flanders went up sharply. The flaw in the regulation provided opportunities for politicians to get seats they otherwise would not have had. In the meantime, the issue has been repaired for future elections. By special decree on 30 June 2016, the number of seats in Flemish provinces has been halved starting 2090. For the next provincial election in 2024, that should make the curve go down again. All other circumstances remaining the same. So far I mentioned mostly flaws and regulations that offered opportunities. Of this coming last example, it is less clear whether it is a flaw or just a cultural thing, maybe even something to praise although I sense something wrong. We go to Belgium again. In Belgium, it is very easy to start a party. You only need to register an association and then you can participate in elections. In Belgium, like in many other countries, except for the Netherlands, the mayor is elected by the people. As it turns out, the best strategy for the mayor to keep his or her position is to have a sharp eye for political talent. The mayor then often asks those talents to join his list for the elections. To these talents it is also a good strategy to join the experienced mayor who, who already is in power, above their own party who may be less exper experienced and with less or no power in the council. 
This mayor's list system is very popular in the French-speaking part of Belgium, Wallonia, and losing interest in the Dutch-speaking region, Flanders. As you can see, the number of parties in municipal councils of Belgium is much lower than in the Netherlands. You can see the yellow line in both of these graphics. Also, the number of parties in municipal councils in Wallonia is much lower than in Flanders. Green is Flanders, grey is Wallonia. Also in Belgium it is mandatory to vote, which is not effectuated, but still turnout is extremely high. The effect of this system means that there are municipalities where only one party participates, gets 100% of the votes, at above 90% turnout. It reminds of countries like North Korea, except anybody can start a new party, challenge the mayor, have open access to media, and still in some municipalities they don't. It even happens that on election day no elections are being held because no new party registered to challenge the mayor. This happened in 2018 in the Flemish municipality of Zuyenkerke. The mayor even tried to organize opposition, but no one was interested. Mayor Alan de Vlieger remained mayor for another six years. In the previous video, I mentioned that Takapera stated in 2007 that votes do not automatically lead to seats, but that the electoral system also influences outcome. Ten years later, he extended this. As you can see, there is no simple line between votes and the distribution of power in seats. The examples in this video illustrated that. Thank you for watching this video. Your comments and questions are welcome below. Do not forget to subscribe and please ring that bell so you will be notified for the next video.